Sorry. <laughs> Scripture reading, Matthew verse 2, chapter 13 through 23. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to, fill, to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to that time, and had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled with what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation. Rachel weeped for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in a place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what, he, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Amen. You may be seated. For, the, for those who wonder why we stand and why we sit sometimes during the scripture reading, uh, it's, a, it's a tradition in many churches, the Methodist Church included, to stand for the reading of the gospel. So when, if we were doing the full lectionary, there would be a gospel reading every week and we would sit for the others and then everybody would stand up for the gospel. What we have done is remain seated if it's not a gospel reading, and if it is a gospel reading, we stand up. So that's, that's a little backstory. There are a number of stories about women in the Bible, some of whom are named, many of whom are not. But since all the stories are told by men and are typically incidental to stories that are primarily about men, it's usually left to female readers to pull out the impact of events on the women who are mentioned. And I think it can be argued that from biblical times through today, there is no greater impact on women in any time or place than motherhood. I picked the passage Bonnie Jean read for us this morning because it crams so many of those impacts into one small section. The first is just the impact of being a woman. Mary is not even named here. Mary, no named, mother. For that matter, neither is Jesus. And he's referred to with the it's instead of his. You know, talk about issues with pronouns. Um, and Jesus and Mary are not mentioned here because they don't have agency. Women and children were then, and in many places today still are, property. The angel comes to Joseph because Joseph's property, in this case his son, is in danger, and Joseph needs to take action to protect him. But Mary's already been through a lot, even here just in chapter two. That angel's been busy, and the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream in chapter one to tell him not to end his engagement to Mary due to her pregnancy. The law would have called for Mary to be stoned if Jesus had said, nope, that's not my child. He was going to, quote, put her away quietly, but that would have been close to a death sentence anyway. Mary had no rights except as the property of a man. 
either a father, husband, or some other male relative, which is why at the cross, one of Jesus' last words is to give the care of his mother over to John. With a pregnancy but no husband, Mary would have been damaged goods. And if there was still a male relative willing to care for her and her baby, she would have been an economic burden to them and likely treated as such. By chapter two, Mary has already been through all of that anxiety and fear, not to mention the physical stress and pain of the pregnancy and the birth away from home. Now, with a baby, she has to flee the country and become a refugee in Egypt. Refugee mothers are suffering and have been suffering forever, it seems. They're suffering at our southern border in detention centers as I speak. They are suffering mightily in Bangladesh right now as a monster cyclone is coming in at the largest refugee camp in the world, full of Rohingya Muslims who have fled atrocities in Myanmar. Like Mary, refugees everywhere have traveled far and at great risk. Also like Mary, they didn't end up there because they wanted to, but because they had to, because what was happening back home was more dangerous still. In Mary's case, the paranoid King Herod is slaughtering all the male children under two years old to make sure that no new king can threaten his hold on power. In the case of many at our southern border, it's gangs and drug cartels slaughtering or kidnapping their children. In Bangladesh, it's mothers, Muslim mothers fleeing persecution. In cases of refugee mothers in other places, it's drought, famine, or war. Sometimes the whole family goes, as Joseph went with Mary and Jesus. But sometimes fathers and even sons have to stay to work or to fight. Sometimes it's the abuse of a father or brother that the mother and child need to flee. The mothers remaining in Bethlehem didn't get tipped off to Herod's intentions by the angel and were forced to bear what mothers in occupied nations and territories the world over have to bear, the random violence of the occupier, the acts of terror that keep subjects in compliance. Those mothers watch the state slaughter their babies. It's likely mothers who resisted met the same fate. Motherhood brings unrivaled joy and wonder. But as the angel told Mary in Luke's gospel, a sword will pierce your own soul too. In describing the horror of Herod's slaughter of Bethlehem's children, Matthew reaches back to the prophet Jeremiah's memory of the children dying during the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem in 587 BCE. Jeremiah writes, a voice was heard in Ramah, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. Ramah is about five miles north of Jerusalem and about 11 miles from Bethlehem. But its significance here is that it was the hometown of Rachel, who's been dead a long time by Jeremiah's time. But Rachel was the preferred wife of Jacob, who was the father of 12 sons, who then became the 12 tribes of Israel. You have to go to Genesis for her story, but her significance for mothers is that Rachel was the mother of just two of those 12 children, Joseph and Benjamin. After begging God for a child for many years and having her sister Leah, who was also married to Jacob, gloat over her and Leah's seeming endless fertility, Rachel finally conceives Joseph. Since Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah, and this seemed like a miracle baby, Joseph becomes the favorite child of Jacob. That favoritism led to resentment in Joseph's older brothers, who then sold him to slave traders, 
and then told Jacob and Rachel that Joseph had been killed by wild beasts. Readers of Genesis know better, and we can follow Joseph's story as he's sold to a prominent Egyptian and ends up saving both Egypt and his father's family when famine hits Joseph's former home. And they have to be refugees who go to Egypt to find food. But Rachel never learns any of that because she dies giving birth to her second child, Benjamin. As far as Rachel knew, the child that had finally been conceived after so many years and tears was dead. Rachel's tragic motherhood speaks to millions of women who have struggled with infertility, women who have lost children, and who have died bringing new life into the world. In rabbinic tradition, Rachel became the face of the suffering of mothers more generally. Stories emerged in the tradition that told of Rachel being able to intercede with God to save Israel, even when the voices and pleas of Abraham and Moses fell flat. So when mothers watched their children die in the siege of Jerusalem, or were forcibly marched into exile by their Babylonian captors. It was the voice of Israel's suffering mother, Rachel, who could be heard crying to God for all of her children, for all of Israel, more than a thousand years after her passing. It's notable that the only woman actually named in this section of Matthew is Rachel. By invoking Rachel's name, all the diverse suffering of motherhood is brought to the fore, even though the direct story is about Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. I think in a similar way on this Mother's Day, we can access the suffering of mothers and their children everywhere through the suffering of mothers in Ukraine. To be sure, there are mothers suffering in Sudan, in South Texas, in Russia, in Bangladesh, and in every city and town across the globe for multiple and myriad reasons. There are mothers suffering in this room and within the sound of my voice. And on a day when the country calls us to honor our mothers, we owe our mothers more than just thoughts and prayers. When you are aware of any tangible help you can give to any mother anywhere, give it. As those who wanted to honor Mother's Day originally intended. As a church, specific relationships in our congregation give us an opportunity to give concrete help to mothers suffering in Ukraine. Bonnie Jean is going to talk to us about that opportunity and what you can do to help. It's in remembering the suffering of mothers and working to alleviate any and all causes of that suffering that we help to ensure that we can truly celebrate those who gave us life and who continue to take on incredible emotional, economic, and physical risk just to bring a child into the world. Rachel is weeping for all her children, and we have a chance to help at least a few of them. Bonnie Jean, will you come? Good morning. I think moms have the most difficult job in the world. And if you asked my mom what I was like as a kid, She'd shake her head, she'd roll her eyes, and with her hands on her hips, she'd likely say, I never knew what to expect with that one. I was that one. But no matter how hard it was, she never gave up on me. A mother's love, there's nothing like it. This morning, I'm honored to share my God-led experience in helping mothers in Ukraine. Some of the questions I'm asked, do I have family there? No. Do I have heritage there? No. How did I get involved? Happenstance. No, that's not accurate. It was God. We know the stats. Tens of millions of homes had no electricity, heat, or water with temperatures below zero. 
Businesses closed, food extremely scarce, and prices outrageously high. No work means no paycheck, means no food, means malnutrition for adults and children. We in the United States are devastated and outraged about a school shooting, and we should be. Russia has intentionally bombed over 3,000 schools, so schools are closed. Kids are home every day, all day. Tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, the numbers are skewed, have been abducted by Russian forces to erase their Ukraine identity and raise them in Russia. I worry about traumatized kids. I worry about traumatized adults. If we were born there, this would be happening to us. Sadly, I personally understand some of this. In 1989, I was vacationing in Venezuela, just 10 miles from Aruba. How different could it be? The plane landed and the country entered a revolution. The streets were sprayed with machine gun fire, food was scarce, and people were buried in mass graves. I can't unsee some of the things I saw, but God uses everything. Who's left in Ukraine? Very young families and very old and disabled who have either nowhere to go, no way to get there, or have chosen to stay in their country. Men are in the military or are volunteer defenders called the resistance in World War II. In large part, they're on their own, away from their families for long periods of time, very limited communication, and don't receive supplies from the military. Many are missing or have been killed. Mothers are alone to care for their children 24-7, literally, trying to keep their children warm, fed, and safe. How do they do that without heat, sporadic electricity, no jobs, and a missing or worse husband or daddy to their kids? I see communications regularly. They're looking for their beloved husband or brother. It's reminiscent of the days immediately after 9-11. I can't imagine a mom feeling so helpless. Children are vulnerable even in a good circumstance, but with extreme poverty and violence during a military invasion, kids suffer significant trauma, and so do adults. Mothers are strong, courageous, and determined, and will do anything for their families. God knows my heart and clearly shows me the way to help. It shouldn't come as a surprise that I coincidentally met a nurse in Arlington who's from Ukraine. Two of her friends run charities in a small town near Kiev. One helps 200 moms and 600 children. The other helps countless volunteers on the front lines. Last August, I learned from her that children desperately needed winter coats. I sent out a Facebook post to request people leaving winter coats on my front porch. I said I'd personally send them to Ukraine. I expected a box or two, but I forgot for a moment God was involved. I received bags and bags and boxes and boxes of gently used clothing and new medical equipment on my front porch from strangers. Many now have become friends and I'm grateful and I'm better for it. God and I have personally collected and sorted and packed and shipped warm clothes and urgently needed items, the vast majority for children. My expectation of one to two boxes was so laughable, it became joyful and emotional. Some of you may have already heard this number, but to those who haven't, take a guess. How many pounds have God and I shipped to Ukraine? 100. Two more guesses. Okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll move on. <laughs> Over 6,000 pounds. Over 6,000 pounds. That's what happens when God's involved. I receive pictures of the kids wearing some of the clothes I send. Sometimes I ship an American flag with the packages so they feel the love we are sending from around the world. I am incredibly appreciative for everything entrusted in me to ship. I communicate with people in Ukraine via Facebook where they posted an amazing message I'd like to share with you. We pay a very high price for the right to live in a free country. War takes away our relatives, friends, years of life, but it'll never take away the memories of our heroes, the dream of a free and flourishing Ukraine, the faith in our victory. With certain periodicity, we receive parcels from Bonnie Jean Butler that contain many useful things we pass on, hygiene products, sleeping bags, 
coffee, candy, hand warmers, meds, and so much more. It's nice to know that somewhere out there in America, so far away, strangers are making sure a small community organization in a small town in a country they may not have known until February 24th, 2022, has gotten the things they need. We would like to thank Bonnie Jean and the USA for their support in such a difficult time. This is so precious. There are many things that are amazing about this message. First and foremost, this is not a thank you to me. This is a thank you to God and to people who have donated gently used items and money to help with shipping. This is a thank you to Crawford Memorial United Methodist Church. This is a thank you to Pastor Ian and to Pam. This is a thank you to First and Second Congregational Church of Winchester. This is a thank you to everyone who's helped. This is a thank you to a young man who was at my house on Friday. He loaded a cargo van with 17 large and extra large boxes I had just packed, a thousand pounds, and he was driving it to Norwell to a shipping container drop off. I wanted him to see how important his contribution was, so I read the message to him. When I finished, he sat on the back of the van. He wiped tears from his eyes and he said, wow, now I understand my purpose. I never thought I had one. I grew up in a bad neighborhood, a really bad neighborhood. I was just learning about community in church. This is a community and I get to be a part of it. Of course, then we're both teary eyed, so downhill from there. But you are each part of that community. At coffee hour, I encourage you to look at the stage and notice the bags and boxes and boxes and bags. Those are candles and metal cookie tins and popcorn tins this church is collecting and generously sending to Ukraine. They are urgently requested. The candles for light, heat, and cooking. The tins, sadly, to keep rodents out of the food. We're having a packing party here on Saturday, June 3rd, if you'd like to help. I think it's important to note I am not a nonprofit. It's just me trying to do the right thing for the right reasons with God's guidance. My friends and family have donated $15,000 for shipping and to purchase urgently requested items like water filters, diapers, baby formula, feminine products, and medical supplies. That money has all been spent, and of course I have receipts for everything to be fully fiscally transparent. I have a large amount of kids' clothing, footwear, puzzles, and games to help them stay busy. Each box holds about 70 pounds and costs about $100 to ship. If you'd like to donate to shipping, it's $50 for a half a box, $100 for a large box. You can write a check to the church with Ukraine in the shipping notation. Psalms 119, verse 28. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Psalms 127, verse 3. Children are a blessing and a gift from the Lord. John 3, verse 16. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee.